Good evening and uh, welcome, welcome again to all of you who are visiting for the open house today. I really hope that you've had a good day. It's been positive, uh, lots of excitement, and you've learned uh, a lot about the school. And also, of course, uh, welcome to all of you who are always here. Um, and, uh, we're always happy to have you uh, every night at all the lectures. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, honor to be able to, to welcome Natalie De Vries. Um, uh, as you know, um, those of you who are here for the open house, we have what we call option studios, and many of these option studios are taught by visiting professors who spend um, a semester or more with us teaching uh, those option studios. And, and Natalie is one of those professors. She's here from uh, the Netherlands. And as you all know, she is uh, one of the uh, three partners of the firm MVRDV. This is a firm that has been in existence for 19 years, almost 20 years uh, next year. And it's been one of the uh, most significant, innovative, uh, practices uh, in Europe. It's great that Natalie is here from the Netherlands while we also have 12 students who are spending this semester actually living and uh, working and studying with uh, Rem Koolhaas and OMA in Netherlands. So we're doing uh, quite a few Dutch studios this semester because Ben van Berkel is also here uh, this semester. But it's, uh, it's really wonderful to have uh, Natalie because Natalie and her partners uh, started the firm uh, by doing competitions, and they won one of their very first competitions, which is a well-known uh, office building uh, that was done for a broadcasting company. And um, from that very, very early stage of their um, career, if you look at their work, one of the things that I find interesting, they're probably one of the firms that think uh, in a very systematic way about the relationship of users to space. There are a lot of architects who think about this, but there are very few architectural firms that actually explore that relationship in terms of its spatial impact. And that's what they've done throughout their, their work. And it, that's, that's something that, that is really important uh, to understand this relationship between functionality and really spatial experimentation, something that's different than the idea of form follows function in the classic modernist sense that was about calculability and about determinism. But this is really also about fun and about new ways and people using buildings in, in unusual ways. And I think this, this concept of the unexpected is part of their, their tool of their trade, if I could uh, put it like this. If uh, you see some of the other projects, uh, such as their Expo Pavilion that they did, they're also thinking about the question of how architecture can really think about issues of sustainability, um, agriculture, and this idea of delight, again, in a different way. That is part and parcel of not just the relationship between architecture and landscape, for example, but as something that is incorporated into the very body of the architectural project itself. So that, again, is, is about a different kind of compactness of these kinds of relationships. Since then, they've done a lot of projects around the world, more recently a number of projects in uh, China. But I think in the European context, one of the things that, that is definitely also significant about their work is their, <coughs> excuse me, is their commitment to housing. Housing is a very, very difficult uh, arena because generally the, the, the framework of, of housing in terms of resources is very limited and it's often focused purely on um, a certain set of alternative typological uh, elements of the, of, the, uh, of the building. Therefore, they've managed to make a project, a program that generally is a kind of very limiting or limited program into also something that provides uh, exciting possibilities in terms of what you 
do and how you make something different out of housing. So I think we have a lot to look forward to. And I'm really very, very happy that uh, Natalie is here doing this exciting studio at the GSD and is also willing to share her work with us. Please welcome Natalie DeVries. here quite a lot uh, this uh, semester as a uh, design critic as it's called uh, here so I'm not quite sure about the carbon footprint of this whole uh, semester with all this Dutch uh, people going uh, back and forth uh, between Holland and, uh, and Boston but uh, well anyway fortunately there's a direct uh, connection and um, and to uh, to compensate a little bit for that we actually do a studio in Boston <laughs> So uh, apart from, uh, from, uh, from my traveling uh, and of uh, Volker Murel's uh, traveling, who I'm uh, co-hosting uh, the studio with, uh, we can actually go uh, to the side uh, with bus uh, number one to, uh, that goes to Dudley Square right in front of, uh, of this faculty. Uh, yeah, so for those of you who visited the open day uh, today, uh, maybe a little bit of a reassurement or maybe a disappointment that... Uh, <laughs> Instead of always going to Africa or uh, wherever for, uh, for exciting uh, studios, there is the occasional uh, teacher that uh, does it just around uh, the corner. Uh, but that's also, I guess, why, because I believe that um, uh, there are, uh, there's of course a lot of specificness uh, uh, in architecture and one of the most specific things is location, site, and knowing uh, so the, the, the ties between uh, the local people and, uh, and their local uh, environment. But on the other hand, I also uh, realize, and we also realize that, that a lot of issues that we are dealing uh, with nowadays in our cities in the Western world are, uh, can be found uh, in more or less uh, uh, yeah, mutual uh, mutations. Um, in, uh, in both Rotterdam and in Boston. Um, I, I could have done the project in, in, uh, in, in the south, in, the, in Rotterdam south, but uh, I, I, I realized I could also do a project uh, about urban regeneration in, uh, in Boston, not so far from here. Um, that's maybe also a bit uh, the European side of, our, uh, of, uh, of, of being, an, uh, being an architect. Um, and a lot of things we are doing uh, are somehow always related to the sites we are uh, working in. Uh, in Europe, you seldom uh, get a tabula rasa where you can start uh, all over uh, again. Um, we are also not so used to doing very big scale uh, commissions, uh, but we are used as uh, architects uh, in the Netherlands and in, in many other European countries to always have a bit of urban design in our schemes uh, as well. In fact, uh, in a lot of the projects, you do not only design uh, a building, but you uh, sometimes are also able to uh, design uh, a smaller or, or a bigger part of a portion of a, of a city or, or of, a, of a development uh, and uh, create then your own buildings in it. And, uh, Interestingly enough, uh, here in Boston, I discovered that there's another Dutch firm uh, actually uh, making a building on, on Dudley Square, not so far from the site our studio is working. And they uh, did a competition there, actually winning also because they did not only design a building for a plot, but making like a mini master plan for a much uh, larger area. And that was appreciated. Um, yeah, thinking about the lecture uh, today and uh, also about my uh, presence here uh, today, uh, there's a lot of things uh, coming together. Uh, as Dean uh, explained, our office started almost uh, 20 years ago. We were quite young at the time, winning a competition and suddenly uh, getting a lot of uh, attention as young architects. Uh, it was a bit of a period of renaissance of uh, the profession of architect uh, in, the, in the early 90s. Uh, in the Netherlands, maybe in, in Europe uh, in general, a kind of reappreciation of what architects could do. Uh, and there uh, was special attention always for young architects because young architects are putting 
uh, as one of the clients that we got then uh, told, told me, uh, actually much more effort and much more work into their commissions sometimes and the elder architects that they, uh, that they met. And this is particularly interesting, of course, for those uh, commissions where the fees are not extremely high, uh, uh, as, for example, in this uh, affordable housing projects uh, that, uh, that Dean was also uh, referring to. Uh, but uh, that's how it goes sometimes with, uh, with sort of uh, upheavals or renaissances uh, uh, of profession. Uh, sometimes it's also maybe a kind of a last, a last bump or a last little hill in what might be also uh, a slow uh, decline uh, of a, a certain type of thinking about, uh, a certain way of practicing uh, a profession uh, in architecture. Because um, at the moment, and this is an interesting uh, brochure I got from the RIBA, it's the British Association of Architects, uh, actually explaining us that uh, although more and more uh, buildings uh, are made all around the world, um, uh, it is actually, uh, uh, w which would be good, of course, if you want to become a, a professional architect. Uh, the fact is that uh, architects themselves have, lesser, have, have less, less and less uh, influence on, on what it is being built in our, uh, in our society. Um, so there's a lot of uh, repetition, uh, maybe architects without architecture with the big A, as you're being taught here uh, at Harvard and other uh, design uh, schools. Uh, and actually, uh, not only uh, are, we, uh, are we losing ground there, but also our profession itself is changing uh, 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 rapidly. Um, so unlike maybe our colleagues uh, 100 years uh, ago, it, it seems sometimes like it's a very slow profession and you could sort of make jumps in time and, and still be, a, you could go back in time and still be an architect. Uh, um, it's not completely true because uh, a lot of aspects of our profession are being taken over by specialists. Uh, partly explainable because there's more and more knowledge put into building and into the processes of building and therefore specialists sort of creep up and take out parts of, uh, of the professional architect's jobs. Um, <clears throat> but on the other hand, um, we could also uh, uh, change, maybe, and eh? that's what the white uh, bracket, uh, what the white uh, part of this, uh, of this brochure shows, in uh, maybe we have to think, rethink our profession uh, better again in, uh, in, in, the, in the contemporary days. Um, so I would like to show you a little bit today in, uh, in my lecture how our office has been uh, dealing uh, with, this, uh, with this aspect. And indeed I uh, thought this year and this studio and this lecture I would like to dedicate a bit to the using, the using of architecture, uh, the, the users of architecture and uh, their relationship with us, uh, their architects. Um, one of the things um, that we've been doing this year is starting to work on a monography. Uh, well, that's something uh, that has actually also eroded a bit over the past uh, years, the whole idea of what a monography is. It's like a sort of very thick, it could be like a very thick office brochure, uh, uh, if you want to, um, and therefore uh, maybe not so interesting uh, uh, to publish except for the architects themselves because they can give them to, uh, to clients and to friends and to your mother. Um, look what I've done in the past years. Um, and another uh, problem with monographies uh, usually is that, um, yeah, it shows usually it shows the buildings right after they've been built. So you have this beautiful sunlit uh, clean uh, buildings, unoccupied uh, sometimes, and all the furniture is, is still in the right position uh, in the building where it was supposed to, uh, to be, and everything still has its original uh, colors. Um, but that, uh, yeah, that is also not so our way of thinking. Now, fortunately, for the past years, we've been uh, photographing our buildings regularly, uh, also when they started to come into use, and also uh, actually showing some of its uh, users. 
Um, but still, uh, uh, we want to make this monography. Yes, okay, also because it was 20 years, uh, almost 20 years, and yes, we did like to also show some of our built uh, work. We've been producing endless amounts of studies and discourses uh, like uh, Pharmax and, and other uh, books in the past years. And we're not interested in the uh, fashionable side of architecture. We don't want to produce Vogue uh, magazines about the architecture. But uh, we also wanted to take an opportunity to communicate about our buildings with others than just the architectural community uh, or, or everybody belonging to that, unlike, uh, unlike uh, uh, in, in most of our uh, other publications. So how to do that? Because, um, yeah, um, it's not going to be completely objective, of course, because we are partly producing it uh, ourselves. Let's be honest uh, about that. But we did hire two uh, journalists, uh, uh, and they don't even like the word hiring because they, we are independent and we want to uh, <laughs> we want to write down what we uh, want to write down. Uh, Ilka and Andreas Ruby from uh, Berlin, and we also hired a uh, a graphic designer. Is this working? Yeah. Uh, Joost Grotens asked Joost Grotens to uh, to join in into uh, into the book, and uh, I don't have samples of what he did uh, yet. They're they're being produced uh, as we speak. But um, with both, uh, uh, with both, uh, with, with the journalists, with, with the Rubies, and with uh, Joost Grotens, we spoke about this aspect of how can we show buildings in uh, our buildings in a bit more honest way, like they are today, and uh, how can we find out how they are used today? Because actually, the whole uh, making of this book is also a kind of, uh, uh, yeah going back into, uh, into what we've done and what we've achieved, because we also want to talk about the buildings that we made in the past years uh, uh, in a way that they are functioning right now. So we have to talk to the users, we have to talk to the clients. We, have to, uh, we think it's interesting also to talk about why we did uh, uh, certain things. Um, and uh, Joost Grotens came with the idea uh, actually to use, this is, this is not yet the, the right uh, pictures, but it just sort of gives an impression. We're actually using also photographs that are not made by us or any professional architectural photographers, but that you can just download from Flickr or from, from the internet. Just to see also, and he, I, I'm very curious, we, we should still see some of the results. He, he, he made some trials where he just showed, uh, yeah, if we talk about this building, this is what I find. So this is apparently what people like or are interested in mostly about it. And, uh, I, I find a thousand pictures showing the building from this side, and I only found one from the other side. Uh, so let's let's see if we can also use that in uh, in the way we uh, communicate about uh, about the project. Oh, and then there's there's interviews, like I said, with us and also with uh, with uh, with users, with clients, uh, but also with uh, with the concierge of buildings, for example, who obviously have to do with technical and functional aspects uh, as well. Uh, yeah, another thing we do and did a lot in, uh, in talking about our architecture, and that's the usage of diagramming and uh, sort of simple iconic drawings to explain why and how we make buildings. So this is all the time you were looking at, a, at an affordable housing project in, uh, in, uh, in Madrid. And um, uh, yeah, uh, so what we'll get uh, when talking about this building is indeed also, that's what the Rubies then uh, bring in. They're, they're specifically interested in how architects nowadays, uh, we have some colleagues that refer in this text already to Elemental and uh, Lacaton and Vassal. How we try as architects to, to get away from the fact that affordable housing nowadays is always associated with a certain limited amount of square meters, instead of trying to just think about a certain budget that you have and see what you can get out of that. And that, that leads to a whole different, sometimes uh, a bit harsh uh, or, or, or less detailed or less luxurious uh, architecture in which we find, for example, more space for, uh, for the inhabitant, in which maybe uh, interesting details that we thought of are, are actually uh, taken out of, uh, of, uh, of the project. Oh, sorry, that's too fast. I have to be a bit more cautious. Yeah, 
So uh, for those of you, uh, some of you might, might have recognized already a, a kind of slightly Corbusian uh, aspect in this, uh, in this building, huh? in this uh, Algiers uh, project where we had this sort of uh, villas that are raised and then you have gardens uh, in between, huh? this image of the long uh, of Tanger, a long strip of, uh, uh, along, the, along the African coast. And, and we did that actually here in, a, in, a, in an affordable housing project in, uh, in Madrid. So suddenly these people get much more space than they uh, would think they would be uh, entitled to. Uh, but do they actually uh, realize that? And how do they like that? So that's what we started to do and, and start to get uh, interviews with people uh, as well. Uh, and uh, we also try to show how we create this sort of, this is sort of a balcony slash could become uh, part of the living uh, space, uh, as you can see in the facade. So how, how is that being uh, perceived? And yeah, to be honest, it's not always a hooray uh, story. I will, I will be showing you some images uh, and some, some, uh, some text clips uh, today in my lecture. Uh, that look actually quite positive, most of them I realized, but that's because my people in the office <laughs> probably didn't dare to take, uh, to take uh, some more uh, hard uh, comments on the building. But I can, uh, I can tell you this. Yeah, so one of the, one of the things, uh, for example, in affordable housing that you realize when you uh, go back and actually talk to the people that moved in there, that they're, are they in there voluntarily or were they on some kind of waiting list? And if they would refuse, they wouldn't get a house in another 10 years. Or, you know, did they really chose your project? And then if they couldn't, are they at all interested in all the special effects that you put into the building or in the, in the special uh, elements? Yeah, that's, that's quite uh, interesting to, uh, to learn about, um, indeed. Um, and one of the one of the one of the influences of the rubies on our on our monography was also uh, in explaining us. Yeah, you can you can still show all these cool diagrams that you make of the buildings and all the architects in the architecture community who say, "Whoa, wow, wow, fantastic!" But uh, uh, I we think that you should, when you want to communicate to a larger audience, also try to make drawings that people who read the book will understand, even if they're not professional. So for all the project, we made uh, a new drawing. Uh, more clearly showing details, you will see uh, uh, people in it to understand uh, the scale. Uh, in plants, we have drawn uh, furniture, often furniture that is uh, related also to, uh, to the pictures you will be seeing. So if you will see a photograph of a house, you will actually see the, the, the furniture in the, in the, uh, in the plants uh, as well. And uh, yeah, like we said, we, we try to figure out how, how the buildings were perceived in their context, what people from the outside were thinking of it. So we also asked for a, uh, for, uh, yeah, just send us your pictures, uh, help us to, uh, to make this book, help us to find out how you, uh, how you think about the uh, building. Uh, led a little bit to some fan mail, uh, I, I must admit, so we still have to edit that uh, a, bit more, uh, a bit more carefully, but... Uh, <laughs> It also, uh, it also already proved to, uh, to give us information and, and photographs uh, of situations we didn't know really were occurring uh, in and around our, uh, our buildings. <clears throat> so uh, first part of my lecture, we've already started, uh, will be a bit about this sort of looking back. Huh? This, uh, it, feel, it feels also a bit like uh, greatest hits uh, stuff, of course, rewind, and then you have to think about, like, I'm, do I have to reproduce it again, or re-edit it, or, uh, yeah. I just, I just <laughs> read a story in a newspaper yesterday about the guy from the Electric Blue Orchestra. I mean, you're all much too young to know about them, but um, he actually replayed everything <laughs> for, his, for, his, uh, for his record, I heard. That's, that's completely odd. So, Obviously, we cannot do that. The buildings are there, and uh, we're dealing with it. This is one of these clients uh, uh, we, who was interviewed again, not by us, but by, uh, by journalists and other, uh, and other people. And uh, I also uh, realized that in the past years, uh, uh, nothing has been so important for us as these uh, clients. Because if you want to make a, make a difference, or if you want to change something, you have uh, you need clients who, who think that as well, or the other way around. Clients who want to do, 
to make a change, to uh, contribute to the development of certain types of architecture, have to know uh, that they want you. And uh, one of our first clients was actually this lady, who is, a, who is an art curator, but also liked to have a hotel. A hotel de Ville, as she called it. Uh, her latest project is actually, uh, she did that with uh, a fashion design students. It was their uh, graduation uh, project. They, uh, they all made different rooms uh, in, a, in a new hotel she's, uh, she's running in, uh, in the center of, uh, of Amsterdam. Uh, Susanne Oxenaar. And um, yeah, so, so what we did was discuss with them uh, uh, how it came about and if it really turned out the way they, uh, they would expect it to, uh, to be. Uh, so in our, in, our, in, a, in, our, uh, in our office in the past years, I realized that we have been uh, dealing a lot, uh, like, uh, like Mosen uh, said, with projects that have kind of a limited uh, moving area for architects, like affordable housing, where sometimes like, you know, even the floor plans are already sort of given to you, like this is more or less how it should be, this is the size. You just make a kind of configuration and wrap it up nicely and put it decently on a, on a site. That's what you have to do. Uh, and, and another aspect that we've been, we've been uh, dealing with a lot, I think, is with typologies with the type of buildings and the development of the architecture uh, for, for very typical buildings. And um, I think that has a lot to do with this mass production that we see of, of buildings all around it. This endless, uh, 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 this endless amount of offices, houses, uh, hotels, uh, whatever. Uh, endlessly being repeated and repeated and repeated, and it's a kind of big sea of buildings growing, uh, growing around us. Uh, and and thinking of uh, yeah, how are we gonna how are we gonna deal with that as uh, as architects? Are we just gonna sort of make take our portion of that and make sure it's sort of halfway decent uh, uh, by the time it's it's built, or can we can we can we change that? Can we change the machine, so to speak? Can we interfere with that. Um, so when we got to uh, this lady saying together with us, hey, we want to do a hotel, but it's not going to be the usual hotel. And I don't want it just to be a boutique hotel where there's some fancy cushions uh, here and there and some nice uh, decoration on the walls. I want to do something completely different. And actually, I don't really want a typical hotel even. Uh, I'm thinking about people can stay here shorter or longer and when they want to change the usage of the room, that's okay with me uh, as well. I, I'll have some furniture uh, and I will, uh, I will be much more flexible uh, in, uh, in how, how we're going to run this, uh, how we're going to run this uh, building. And uh, at the same time, the municipality saying, okay, this is, a, this is one of the last buildings uh, standing in a new waterfront development where it's mainly housing uh, made. We want this hotel also to be like a living room for the people living around it. So there you see also that already a lot of conditions of this sort of traditional typology, the hotel, are starting to uh, change. So the building has to perform much more uh, functions than just being a hotel. Um, and what's very funny, I'm, I'm staying now here in Boston in, uh, in the, the Boston Park Plaza Hotel, which was uh, built in the 20s by uh, a guy called Stadler. And he practically invent, is one of the inventors of the, of, the, of the modern hotel. So we get these instruction videos all the time on the TV explaining how he systemized uh, the bathroom, how he put all the bathrooms on top of each other, how, yeah, in a kind of small and efficient way, he standardized the businessman's uh, hotel, how you could drive there by car and uh, have all these special functions in the building. So uh, uh, very funny that, uh, yeah, where in his time things were sort of minimized and optimized, uh, we are now actually in, a, in another era again where we uh, have so much of this minimized and optimized uh, buildings that we are longing for, for a, different, uh, a different type of hotel again. A hotel because a lot of us are living in hotels a large amount of the time or we're using them as, as, our, as our base to work as well in a completely different uh, society uh, again. 
And uh, so we decided actually it's kind of the anti-Stedtler hotel. It's not systemized and standardized. Uh, it's bathrooms. It's not like you come in and then to the left or to the right, there's the bathroom and then there's the rest of the room with a lot of furniture that you really don't want to use or cannot use or it's too small or too big. Uh, but all the bathrooms, that was the key actually in this uh, building, uh, are different. Some of them are actually completely missing and you just have a shower out of your uh, room. But yeah, of course you don't know that as, uh, as the client explains uh, when you don't see the other rooms. So um, that's, that's an interesting thing of course. So you get into this room and it's different. And, uh, and that's one of the discoveries that you also make when you make such a building is that what, what do people expect when they go to a hotel? Uh, so I was explained once by a guy from Hilton that part of their success is like wherever you go all around the world, if you enter their hotel rooms, you know exactly what you will be getting and uh, it's totally predictable. So this is more like the hotel for those who, uh, who don't want to get the, uh, the predictable. Um, another part of our job uh, was not that we didn't, didn't do all the rooms uh, just by ourselves, but uh, a lot of these bathrooms and special elements in the room were made together with uh, designers, uh, furniture designers, uh, Dutch designers that actually design everything from furniture to pots and pans to uh, uh, whatever, which is one of the more interesting uh, uh, aspects of our time as well, that we, um, that we can uh, collaborate much more and that uh, we are, are not like the architect who takes all the decision, who designs just the, until the last doorknob, but that we actually, uh, uh, with pleasure, uh, give uh, elements of our work out of hand. So uh, you could say that this specialization can uh, also lead in your own buildings to, to rather uh, unexpected, uh, unexpected uh, sites. So when you collaborate, for example, with artists uh, uh, and designers that, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, there was one out. So there's this fantastic room inside this building uh, designed by Joop van Lieshout. It's called the multi-women bed, which has a bed in it for, for eight people instead of just for, uh, just for two. So uh, also interesting, by the way, that we uh, squeezed out of our, that we made 90 bathrooms and that Joop did 10 for the same price. So his 10 are just as expensive as our 90. Um, okay, so that's one of the... Uh, one of the <laughs> aspects of, uh, can be one of the aspects of collaboration uh, as well. So again, uh, making sections and drawings in which this piano that is one of the rooms actually uh, comes back into that uh, room again. Um, what was also quite, quite funny about making this, uh, making this book is that uh, we got a look behind the scenes as well of our, uh, of our clients uh, in this case. Um, yeah, and also, uh, led to us to realize again that the past 20 years were also quite a crazy period, of course, when the stock techs uh, uh, grew and grew and where people were shopping around in the world, uh, trying to invite uh, different uh, architects for their, uh, for their projects, which uh, we don't even know sometimes. So you might be competing uh, suddenly with somebody. And uh, in this case, apparently we got a commission because we responded. Our response time was, uh, was a little bit, uh, a little bit faster. Um, and um, yeah, so making this book also gives us an opportunity to be, to explain a little bit more about uh, what's behind the scenes. Um, our architecture is quite uh, clear and obvious sometimes. Uh, some people say uh, at some point, maybe it's almost like a gimmick, like a sort of one off uh, uh, thing. But, if you start to know the, the client when you read this book, you will also realize uh, uh, how, uh, how their uh, peculiarities have led to this, uh, to this uh, special uh, villa. So the barcode house in Munich, for example, it's quite a huge villa. It doesn't show like that because it's split in two. It wasn't allowed to make uh, one big house. The house they wanted was too big for the area that they wanted to live in. And therefore this house has been uh, split in two parts, a working part and a uh, in the living part, only connected underground by a swimming pool, so you could sort of swim from, uh, from one side to the next, or walk. 
uh, clients in a kind of midlife crisis. They sold their company. They had a lot of money. They wanted to build a house. They wanted to work in the house. Um, we made this design in which each, each room uh, has its own, uh, has its own uh, character. It's like a little house next to a little house next to a little house. So you have the, like a bathtub house, the children's house, the living room house, the work house, the kitchen house. Uh, so this bigness is sort of scaled down again in, in, uh, in, uh, in, this, in these bars. And uh, what was also quite uh, interesting to find out when we revisited the project that the couple had divorced in the, in the meantime. And, uh, and these are actually their two rooms because they want, it's just a balcony, <laughs> they wanted every now and then to retreat in the house. So. At the time, we already thought it was kind of a bit of a peculiar question, but uh, knowing, uh, knowing now that, uh, that they've split up, I guess uh, it's gotten more self-explanatory. So um, the, the, the woman and her children are still, uh, are still living there. Um, yeah, and, and I guess uh, what most architects are not talking about so much is the incredible interaction you have with your clients as well. I mean, uh, the lady from the hotel, uh, actually, she's much more crazy than we are. Um, so we had to stop her every now and then. And uh, this one just started to, they, were, they worked in advertisements before, they just started to call uh, companies like, okay, if you're gonna make my floor, um, I'll make sure that it's, uh, the house is published and this and this magazine, and then you get a first right to publication, and et cetera, et cetera. So she, she basically bargained the whole house together via selling it as an advertisement to, uh, to different companies. <laughs> um, so also, we, we couldn't publish it because she already sold the publication to uh, Schöne Wohnen. Uh, yeah, so don't underestimate. Uh, uh, strong ladies in this case uh, working on the uh, <laughs> on the projects. Yeah, so this is of course a very specific type of client, the clients that know what they want, that can uh, help you to push forward uh, specificity in, uh, in projects. Uh, but then we of course also have completely different clients that are maybe a bit harder to uh, find and to, uh, to talk to. Uh, and I don't know really if we will succeed at, uh, for that in this, uh, in this book. Partly we ha because we haven't that much uh, built project yet in, the, in these countries. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> another, another, of course, the anonymous users, the one that we form follows function uh, designs were made for uh, when we started to build mass housing. When, when mass housing developed uh, uh, at the beginning of the last uh, uh, century. And now, of course, uh, uh, the people living in the developing countries where enormous amounts of uh, houses are being, uh, are being built, in Asia, uh, for example, in India, uh, in China, in Korea. Uh, and if you land there as an architect, so where, where do you go with your attitude? Eh? So nice to make a lot of diversity, uh, but thank you very much. You have to build uh, uh, a couple of thousands of houses here on a plot uh, of yeah okay there's people living there now but we're gonna we're gonna move them out so uh, we'll make space for that um, can you keep the old texture the old texture of the, in this case an area in uh, Tianjin in China uh, or uh, will you just start again and create these islands where this mass housing will be uh, erected so where are you like this sort of funny European architect uh, Trying to make hybrid balconies that afford, well, you know, completely different situation. Where is your attitude at that point? Um, so, in this, one of his first projects we ever did in, in, uh, in China, we started to uh, struggle with the layout of such, a, of such a master plan, of such an island. I think one of the design studios actually, uh, and this uh, semester is dedicated to the super block uh, uh, in, uh, in China. You could say these are these super blocks where we were supposed to put a lot of towers uh, in. Um, and we started to struggle to the amusement, but also estrangement of our developing clients with trying to figure out how we could uh, 
keep the street pattern, how we could plant trees, how we could actually, uh, instead of letting these uh, buildings uh, land on, uh, on islets, being gated, and then you go to the next island and go to the next island, not really uh, 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 making, uh, making a new or urban uh, setting. Um, to struggle and find out, always with the regulations that are given to us, how we could keep the streets uh, in the city. And that uh, uh, leads then to this funny differences in, in, in density, because I guess one of the misunderstandings that we're trying to be talking about already uh, from right from the beginning of our office, also in, uh, in the Dutch uh, situation, but also in, uh, now in this Asian situation in, in, in publications like Pharmax, is that if you have growing, growing numbers of buildings, does that automatically lead that everything just has to be stacked and end up in the towers and that you just go, you know, go, to, go to these towers and then you go up and, and down uh, on, the, on street level you only have cars and uh, you know, some, some vague, uh, vague parks. Uh, uh, yeah, so in this case we try to, within the confinements of, of our commission, uh, combine extreme low rise with uh, the, the single family house with, uh, with the apartments that were also, uh, also needed. Um, uh, and we actually managed to, to deal with it. We, one of the biggest issues, of course, being the views that you would need from the towers, but also the shading and the, the sun regulations, so that if you would li be living down there, that you wouldn't have a shadow in your uh, garden uh, all day. And also an assumption that um, I think that's, that's very important in, in all our work, that not everybody likes to live in the same way. It's hard sometimes to figure out who doesn't want to live in the same way as his neighbors or his family or his whatever. Uh, but we are actually sure that even in this sort of enormous amount of buildings that we're making, there should, still should be spaces for uh, individual uh, development of, of project, for smaller scale uh, development, for, um, uh, let's say, difference. It's just not that everybody has to have the same difference, therefore everybody gets, uh, gets something uh, uh, the same again, but it's sort of figuring out, and, and that's why this relationship between urban design and architecture is also important, is how we can sort of combine the two, uh, uh, and at the same time, um, uh, yeah, still be sure that we produce the amount of buildings and houses that we uh, should be making. It's not like a denial of the fact that all these housing have to be uh, produced, but it's trying to arrange things differently. For example, on ground level, to have a different relationship between the, the public and the private in this project. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is what you will be, uh, be getting then. And so there is uh, just a mini struggle to make a less gated uh, world, you could say also, because there will be eyes on the street and there's not a necessity to completely lock it down uh, all the time. But is it completely, uh, let's say, could just anyone walk in there? Or, and if you would be looking a little bit shabby, nobody grabs you and takes you out? No, that's not the case. It's still uh, a controlled uh, environment. So, um, yeah, you might say that we sort of try to sabotage it, but it's not, it's not completely... Uh, completely uh, worked, yes. Uh, yeah, and so this, this is also uh, uh, what I think is very important, that when you have your practice and you're trying things and you're experimenting, well, first of all, your experiments will be lived in or worked, people will be working in it. So that's one part of uh, the question. They have to be sold, they have to be affordable, they have to be sustainable, they have to be like all these different things. They, don't, they shouldn't leak. Uh, uh, somebody should be able to sell it again uh, at some point. Uh, but at the same time, you want to move on, you want to uh, uh, experiment. Yeah, that's, that's really the, the only word that I, can, uh, that I can find for it. So uh, as you look at the build works that we did, uh, there's of course a difference between the, 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 the theoretical studies that we're doing that are like possible utopias or dystopias that you can also develop together with students, uh, for example, uh, in research projects for the year 2050. Uh, 
uh, an aspect of our of our work that uh, like shown in the first uh, graphs of the RBA is actually one of the one of the responsibilities that we always had as architects and, and should keep and actually even develop much further is that you use your uh, uh, ability to spa to spatialize to visualize a built future uh, in predicting maybe or anti-predicting uh, the way our future is uh, is going to uh, look so uh, uh, but it's also interesting to see uh, whether in your build projects you can already sort of start to move slowly in that direction and try to realize elements of that. So uh, vertical, so, so maybe we can make at some point vertical villages again, that we can sort of, this whole pattern that we wiped, that was wiped out in uh, Tenjin, I always wanted, almost want to say I wiped out, but that's not completely true, but it was wiped out before we came that we can sort of lift that up again and that uh, somehow in a three-dimensional, more three-dimensional, more dense uh, situation, uh, everybody could uh, live in his own uh, house again. Yeah, it's, it's possible in a smaller scale, you could say. This is, this is, a, this is, a, <laughs> this is an exhibition in uh, Taiwan, in Taipei. Uh, obviously, there are some issues to be solved still in there. Uh, you will all recognize that. But, um, well, yeah, looking at the fact that we did solve part of it by making this high rise and then in between this extremely uh, low rise. So I have sort of the feeling that maybe at some point we'll be able to have to meet, let these things uh, meet. Okay, I will go on a little bit faster. Uh, so there you also see how you can, through studies and work and the interaction between them, uh, sort of create a new outlook on. Uh, on our built uh, environment that is architecturally, that is architectural, that is made by architects and urbanists. That is not a vision from developers or politicians, but that's a way we can look into the future with our knowledge as, uh, as architects. And in, in a way, then, if I look back to one of the very, very first projects that we uh, did, we had actually already started to do that. You know, we should hang, hang some of the houses uh, on the wrong side of a uh, of a building. Uh, so yeah, so this is sort of the, the foreboat of uh, of that. Um, all these things sort of starting to uh, to tie together. So that also means that one building actually can mean uh, that you're already giving a glimpse of uh, of the uh, of the future. And uh, yes, not everybody wants to live in that. Uh, 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 yet, but uh, some some of us love to uh, to live in it, and uh, yeah, so it's it's a great excitement in a in a very normal, somewhat backwards uh, neighborhood in Amsterdam. Suddenly, the the houses are on the wrong side of the gallery, and I think even the uh, 87 other houses in this building that are completely normal uh, still have the fun of uh, having this uh, this. Uh, slightly uh, eccentric uh, aspect in their uh, in the building like is also shown <laughs> that until today uh, they actually entertain a lot of tourists which is nice if you're like 87 and you're living in your little apartment in uh, in Amsterdam uh, yeah in this in this case actually the client said to us okay we have of course our aging population but what if you and me get to be 65 or 70, where would you like to live, you know? Would you like to really live in those houses they built for the elderly today? Ah, please design me a building that you would like to live, that I would like to live in if I'm, uh, if I'm older. We're normal people uh, as well. So part of the fan mail, uh, again. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, uh, yeah, one of the other aspects of the book also very interesting is that when you build for anonymous users you often cannot get in anymore as architects we've made a sort of sport right from the beginning that we always the early buildings we always photographed all apartments empty and then we went back right after people moved in and uh, with a photographer and a nice uh, nice uh, chatting up uh, person and can we make a picture of your apartment how you are using it uh, and this one actually we came across in a, in a, in a newspaper magazine interview. <laughs> uh, 
in, a, in a building we did in, uh, in uh, Copenhagen. So uh, obviously the building has curved, uh, curved walls for, uh, for other uh, reasons. Um, and uh, this guy is living in basically in his, uh, in his, own, uh, in his own world. Uh, and it's also funny actually to show that because, yeah, uh, in this project, uh, it actually reminds me a bit of the lecture I saw yesterday of Bill Baker, the uh, SOM, uh, uh, the, the fantastic structural engineer, telling about cores and cantilevers. That actually, when you have a very fantastic sturdy core, you can cantilever it in infinitive, uh, almost at infinitive ways. So we cantilever the whole house uh, here, as you can see. Oh, no, not in this. Oh, I, I sort of mixed up the order of the building a bit, the lecture. Oh, yeah, there you are. Uh, so that's, that's another part of the fun, because uh, and that's actually another funny congru congruity I realized. With yesterday, yesterday, I went to two lectures here at Harvard. That's how, at GSD, that's how things go at Harvard. I, I saw this lecture of the SOM, Structural Engineer, who makes the tallest buildings uh, uh, in the world, but I also saw uh, a small lecture by Philip Oswald, who was uh, talking about pre and post architecture, and in how actually as architects uh, we have to deal more and more with what's already there, with the built masses, and that a lot of the work we will be doing in the future is actually not uh, making fantastic new buildings, but having to figure out what, what we have to do with all the stuff that's being built and has to be uh, converted already uh, or reused in a certain way. So in this case, not making in a competition the houses inside uh, the two silos, but actually uh, cantilevering them, uh, helped us to create a space we would never have made if we would have made a new building. I mean, it would have been outrageous. Uh, clients would have said, uh, are you crazy? I'm not going to make this big void space. We can fill that up with houses, you know, I can sell houses. Uh, but in this case, uh, we could make houses with no structure inside, virtu virtually, with this magnificent view. And, uh, yeah. Uh, but this case is, is actually on the other side of the spectre. This is not anonymous and poor users or elderly uh, people with not much money. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's more the rich and the, and the football players and the more luxurious uh, apartments uh, that we have here. But still, we got inside. Um, and I guess still one of the key projects in that uh, development, uh, in that, that thinking in our work, was this uh, silo dam building that we made, uh, uh, started to make 15 years ago. So it was, it was, uh, it, it just turned 10 years, 10 years old. Um, and this, I guess, is one of the most experimental buildings that we uh, that we did, and we actually uh, programmed it and said. Uh, there's many different uh, people living in here. There's affordable housing, subsidized affordable housing, and there's very luxurious apartments in it. It's in Amsterdam. It had to be built in a river. It had to be quite deep because of the urbanistic requirements to match with the, with the silos uh, standing next to it. Uh, and we were, uh, this, so this was actually the ultimate uh, commission, of course, for, for our office in how do we make a building which has low income, middle income, high income, two bedroom, three bedroom, four bedroom, uh, less expensive, more expensive, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what is that for a building? Uh, yeah, maybe it's just a building that has many different types of houses in it, uh, but not like the hotel, every room is different or every house is different, but let's make small neighborhoods again out of these uh, out of these uh, groups of uh, houses. So this is one type of housing, this is another one. Actually, it's the same floor plan as the building with the cantilevered houses that we just saw. It's a, it's a housing group for elderly. Uh, here we did something that, uh, they, uh, that is a, a, a quotation from a, from a Kabushian, uh, uh, the Unité house, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Big apartments uh, with brick, uh, steel, uh, lofts, uh, well, any, anything you can imagine. Uh, but also, uh, uh, yeah, again wrapped up in this uh, in this big uh, in this big building. And uh, our idea was we create mini neighborhoods uh, inside this building. People will get to know each other, and they realize also that's where I'm living, and that's not where I'm living. So it's also kind of a way uh, to get out of the anonym, anonymous uh, aspect of large uh, apartment buildings. 
Uh, and this building turned out to be uh, weirder than we, uh, and, and its inhabitants, weirder than we would actually expect uh, uh, this building to be. And now uh, they're actually running their own organization of giving tours through the building. You can buy postcards. Uh, with the money from, uh, from the tours they give through the building, they organize parties. Um, and uh, yes, the people do meet in... Uh, in, uh, in many different uh, ways in this building. So they do feel like they are part of certain communities, uh, but also of the, uh, of the bigger uh, one. And they tell all these stories about how they live in the building or how they wanted to live in the building or how somebody found uh, an apartment in the building for them. Uh, again, uh, also uh, making all kinds of different, uh, uh, different floor plans inside, like I said. Uh, somebody, uh, Martin Close, who, who runs an architecture gallery, uh, uh, sent us uh, actually a poem he made by uh, is it one of the inhabitants. And this picture that he was hanging in the streets of Amsterdam for a long uh, time uh, uh, for the building. And uh, uh, what was most interesting is that they actually made a book uh, in August because the building was uh, 10 years old. So the inhabitants made their own book about the story of the building. This is this uh, book explaining uh, how, uh, how these different uh, types uh, uh, were, uh, were made and their names, showing the floor plans. Uh, here you also see how we actually, as architects, are having to deal with this diversity and trying to find structural systems in which we can make a lot of differences that can be piled on top of each other and, and uh, uh, solving very simple but complicated uh, issues when you make very much different floor plans is how to get the, the water and the electricity and the air uh, up and down. Um, trying to uh, fight a little bit with the, the client that wanted to put in more and more houses because he knew it would sell quite well uh, uh, and still finding spaces and in, in uh, finding ways how to sabotage the routing through the building in such a way that they could never compartmentalize it uh, uh, later on, but that you always would be able to go through the whole building. So if you're living downstairs, you could also go upstairs to one of the balconies. Uh, yeah, and this is one of the one of the inhabitants is a photographer. So they actually did what we wanted to do also in the pornography. We didn't know they they did that is, uh, in in actually showing all the different inhabitants uh, in their uh, in their house and interviewing them and asking them about uh, uh, what they liked. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit Rotterdam in Amsterdam, Rotterdam, the harbour city. Uh, this uh, lady is a life coach uh, that explains us that uh, it's uh, uh, social cohesion is, uh, is uh, reached in this building. Um, and this is uh, actually the woman that started making the book that was sort of a fan of the building and tried to get in. That's what she describes here. Uh, and she gives us this uh, amazing... Uh, detailed insight in her uh, life uh, as well. So uh, I guess this should be in our monography uh, too. Not, not many, not, not often you see your users actually using the bathroom uh, in, uh, in the building. What's this? I have to read sometimes. It's a long, it's long text. So uh, yeah, all right. Uh, so they also sort of start to occupy uh, the building uh, by creating uh, all kinds of different spaces like libraries and sports facilities uh, inside the building. Like I said, they uh, organize tours and then they organize parties from the tour. So if you visit the building, you will be supporting uh, uh, the fun they have in there. And it also shows we didn't, we didn't put in much extra space. Like our client wanted to sell as much floor plan as possible. We just made little balconies, some bigger balconies, some some extra spaces in corridors, and that's because of the pe peculiarity of the building, people really started to understand it and start to use this as well. They made a collection of all the publications and the interviews they gave to Korean television programs, uh, <laughs> etc. Okay, so I don't know how much time I have, but uh, not halfway. 15? Okay, then we have to move on. Fast um, and uh, like ultimately, of course, what you also see is architects really making their marks on uh, buildings, designing all this specialness. Uh, 
But the next step might well be uh, not to design the house itself anymore and just make a, uh, a kind of envelope in which people can design their own uh, houses. So this is actually what this project is about in Leiden, uh, where we were asked as the, as the urban designer, where uh, again in a, in a relatively poor neighborhood, we were uh, asked to think of ways how to give uh, also people who have not, not enough money to build a, a villa, uh, still an opportunity to influence uh, the way they live. Uh, only uh, there was not, uh, not a complete uh, agreement on in which way that should be done. So the, the housing corporation, the municipality, all the specialists they hired. Uh, green dots means that's what I like very much. It ranges from apartments to single family homes and everything that's, uh, that's in between. So uh, as an answer to that, we just thought we'll develop a block or a plot uh, uh, that can have it all, that, can, that you can use in many different uh, uh, ways. Um, and actually the plot, it's, it's all the time 18, uh, 18, uh, 18 houses can be made. There's only uh, cars in some of these horizontal, uh, in, this, in this street. And you can get into car parks. And this is all uh, completely pedestrian. Uh, this, this simple plot that we designed can contain 18 uh, houses. It's put on a car park. The car park is naturally ventilated. That determines the, the length uh, of the house. And you should be able to more or less build normal houses in it. So uh, the only thing we did design was this sort of plot and, and the zoning of, uh, of the building, which we thought well, might be nice that you could have pitch roofs because of, uh, of, of the context of the project. And the maximum distance between two, uh, two blocks. And very important, the, the, the soil is polluted. So the, Parking, uh, the, the air, the ground is, is lifted with one meter to cover the pollution. Uh, we did one other thing in the section, uh, and that's the split level. So uh, with this sort of minimal act of sabotage, we managed to create a, a an envelope that, uh, and we had to prove. Uh, there was a, an exhibition, uh, an, a competition for young architects organized to prove it uh, that you could actually make houses with these rules. Um, so uh, 200 young architects delivered designs that uh, later on actually got built. That you can build houses in that, and um, this is one of the one of the examples of the projects being built. So here you see actually how we are architects, but we already start to make designs that do not include architecture in a traditional sense anymore. It's like more like creating something in which people can start to build their own houses and in which individual architects can start to, uh, to develop their own uh, schemes. There's a lot of stuff explaining to the people going there that they don't spend more than 377,000 euros when they, uh, when they build here. Websites started, and then they started to build. Um, now, one of the funny things is that we made an envelope, which was a maximum envelope, and the people living here were selected, so they were supposed not to have so much uh, money. But what everybody did uh, immediately, uh, like in the first project I showed you for the anonymous user, is of course build the maximum envelope. So you will see a lot of houses where the architects have be become very creative in using uh, simple materials, but still creating large volumes uh, with that. On the left side is social housing, so they hired another architect. and. Uh, expected that people, uh, 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 people's tastes have, are quite traditional, so that's what people like. <laughs> and uh, the reality was that those that could make their own house and, and hire their own architects did what you see on the right side uh, of the street. Uh, and here you also see how this thing with the section uh, works and how people make roof terraces uh, and have these uh, patios. Because this is a really high density way of suburban living. Huh? So we're back again to the theme we had in China. So how can we give people, that's the Dutch situation, uh, people like to live in suburban uh, condition in the Netherlands, have a little garden, but we don't want these people all to, live our, uh, to leave our cities, we want them back in the city. So we have to offer them somehow conditions that are like these suburban conditions, but then uh, in a much denser, uh, in a much denser uh, way. <clears throat> and this was, these are all actually photographs that I took from a book, again, that the neighborhood made and 
was uh, made with interviews uh, uh, done by journalists. Um, and here you also see how, how like everybody build, starts to build the maximum envelope. So even people whom, according to the political uh, presumptions and uh, the thoughts that the municipality had, would not have enough money to build such a big house, built a really big house. Uh, and that's then something you learn again from your experiment where you actually don't, I mean, maybe you remember this first Kashba-like image that we showed. People start to build their, the biggest house uh, possible. Uh, and then, of course, uh, they build it in, in groups. They build, uh, sorry, I have to go back one. I was pointing in somebody's eye probably now. <laughs> so what, um, what, what they did is they built these 18 houses in, in small uh, collectives. So groups were formed and together they built on this uh, parking garage. And of course the next step is that uh, we know now from other urban schemes that we made, for example this one in Spain, is that small groups can also build their own power plants uh, in their uh, neighborhoods. So there's a whole new thinking you could imagine. Uh, like this apartment building, that groups of people can start to build their own parts of city, they run their own electricity uh, uh, company. Uh, yeah, they, they basically run their own, uh, their own town uh, in this way. Um, okay, some recent works as well. Uh, this was really like a flashback uh, thing, but it, it shows a bit the, the thinking that we have and the possibility uh, to, to interview the people that we're actually uh, uh, building for and to try to figure out as architects if things really worked out the way we thought they would. And uh, uh, it also shows you, of course, a bit the limitations and the, uh, the edges of, uh, of, uh, of what you could call the extremities that we've also, the, the limits that we've tried to uh, push and find uh, and the way people are, are dealing with it. Um, Recent projects in uh, two buildings. Uh, one is started as a master plan in uh, in Oslo uh, of a uh, another very monofunctional type of uh, thing. It's it's a business uh, park area with a hotel in it, some leisure uh, functions. Uh, again, it's a, a type of project that could easily end in a couple of towers uh, put together on a uh, on a tray. Uh, and in this case. Um, by uh, dividing up the plot in a completely different way, we uh, also started to try to bring in some street life into, uh, into, that, uh, into that building. Um, an urban design, uh, which this is the competition uh, model, uh, called a barcode. And uh, by, by changing this typology, not making blocks, uh, uh, but actually these very slender, narrow, funny buildings, we could suddenly give all the buildings an address to the fjord. Um, we said we, you should mix functions. You should not just make one building which is a hotel, one building which is this, one building which is that. Uh, mix it all up. Uh, start to create regulations where it's not big, one big chunk of building, but uh, make slits in between. So again, a kind of urban uh, regulative uh, way of describing architecture. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, also uh, sort of subversive in a sense that we could almost predict already what type of buildings would, uh, would start to, uh, to come out of it. Now, I won't go in all the details of this uh, exercise, but through the years uh, we've been uh, managing the master plan uh, as well. Uh, Winnie, my partner, has gone back and forth to Oslo, talk to, talk to people who want to build here. We wanted to make sure, of course, that our extreme ideas wouldn't lead to a sort of a monofunctional, there's only one way to build it, but that it will really create uh, a lot of different uh, possibilities. This is 2004, I think. You can see how uh, we even use uh, software to calculate uh, the, uh, the regulations, the influence of sunshine, the optimization uh, for the clients, for the developers, very important that they wouldn't end up with too little square meters, of course, uh, in the whole scheme. And in the end, this is the, uh, the, the, the result of the whole process of the, the different clients and, uh, and wishes uh, that came, uh, to, came together on the site. Uh, we were fortunate to be able to make one of the buildings on the site as well, a headquarters of a bank. Um, needless to say that in 2008, we were a bit like, oh my God, 
we're designing headquarters of a bank, what will happen to that? Um, but the project uh, uh, continued, and um, uh, yeah, then we started to sort of follow our own uh, rules, you could say. Uh, and you see how all our different regulations start to, to influence this, uh, this building, creating a public passage through, uh, opening it up. And the idea, the concept behind it was to, to create a kind of rock, like a, like a natural formation in the, in the Oslo uh, landscape with our building. Uh, uh, a rock that you can also climb, of course, that you can, uh, 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 instead of this uh, bank bunker, or kind of rep representational, just glass, uh, ivory uh, glass tower, uh, Actually, this bank is uh, subversively being eroded and invaded. Uh, and like we did with the public program, also the program inside the building was dispersed in such a way that you can, you know, that all the people working in the building, something which we already did in this first office building, uh, uh, Dean was uh, uh, talked about, uh, also made it possible that everybody moves through the whole building, that you're not the you don't have the people from the third floor and the fifth floor and from the top floor, but that all the people in the building are using the complete uh, building. Um, special routing, it's, they have a trader room in it, so we had some different routings inside as well. And all the studies uh, made to uh, optimize, uh, uh, this is of course for, uh, for you guys the interesting <laughs> part. Sorry I went over this uh, so far. So it's not, it looks quite obvious, but there are many ways to get there. Um, so it's always interesting that the more we started to use uh, the computers, we, the more we also started to make models, because uh, that's of course for very interesting. When I start, when I graduated, I, I made hand drawings. There was no computer available yet that, uh, in the way that you're using it now. Um, but the more and more we started to use computers, the more and more we started to make models at the same time, because you know, like when you're looking at your screen and you're sort of but these models are the, are the only thing that you can just take in your hand and you can look at it and see, oh my God, what am I doing? Uh, in computers, you can really fool yourself for a long time and always taking the favorable uh, point of view. Uh, so there you see it. Uh, and of course, uh, yeah, even in this bank, we sort of try to invade, at least show people moving around it. It's like if the street moves up, uh, they will be out there on balconies. They will have these uh, views to, uh, to the street. It's actually broken down also in scale, of course. Uh, so there's a whole lecture you can dedicate to that topic uh, of this sort of structuralist, post-structuralist uh, uh, way of thinking. Uh, yeah, okay, I can move on. And these uh, special elements you're seeing, uh, they are uh, developed in such a way that they coincide with the way people want to work, the units that this bank has, the collaborative units, uh, but also the possibilities to make all kinds of interaction, to use it for the climatizing of the building, um, to not just any random play of, uh, of, uh, of spaces. Um, like I said, the routing through the building, carefully avoiding the, the dealing room, because uh, that's secret uh, again. Which is also funny, I think, that you have this secret routing and this, uh, this more open routing. Making sure that the, the floor plans still stay uh, effective, that you can escape in time. Uh, that you can make different types and typologies of offices inside all these crazy uh, shapes, uh, etc. Yeah, it's still under construction, so I can't show you uh, the, f the, the final uh, result. It will be ready uh, by the end of this year. Uh, but here you see uh, how it's being constructed and how the neighboring buildings are being constructed so that I'm not telling you uh, fairy tales uh, here. Uh, uh, so so you, you could say this is, this is how our thinking even in the most sort of, you could say there are not much building types that are less, I mean prisons obviously, but that are less <laughs> closed than uh, bank headquarters, uh, and you can still uh, make them to interact with their, uh, with their environment, with the, with the city. And inside, also development, uh, developing them as if they were small uh, cities, and just uh, instead of just going up and down elevators, uh, you're actually uh, uh, invited here 
to take these stairs to go up and down. And you suddenly meet a colleague at the coffee machine, like, hey, I didn't know you were here. No, that's true, I'm working on the fifth floor. That's nice. More opportunities for romance uh, <laughs> and other uh, things. Interaction between different levels of uh, collaborators. Last projects I'm showing, yes, can I take some more time here? Okay, I'm just, I'm just going on. You just stop me when I have to stop. Um, this build mass I was just talking about, of course, uh, old hotels, silos, fantastic stuff to deal with. Uh, you can even make greater spaces uh, in them than you would ever dreamt of making in, uh, in new buildings. Uh, but there's also, of course, um, a less uh, romantic reality of, uh, of uh, the existent uh, buildings. And this is actually an installation that was made in the Venice Biennale by Dutch landscape architects. In the previous Biennale, they foamed empty buildings in the Netherlands, sort of trying to show... I mean, for offices, we know in the Netherlands, it's not such a big country, we have 16 million inhabitants. We have 7 million square meters. I don't know how much square feet that is. 7 million square meters of empty offices at the moment. So roughly one third of all our offices are vacant. Uh, and there's much more buildings, old schools, churches, uh, factories, etc., etc. A huge amount of empty. These are all the empty buildings in the Netherlands, according to them, at some point. Uh, so there you are, you graduated from uh, GSD, and uh, what's going to be your future? Well, it might be that you will have to spend a large amount of time unless you find all these magnificent museum builders and villa owners uh, 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 to, uh, to, uh, to cater to. Uh, but the, the reality might be that you will actually have to go into these uh, guys uh, here, these big buildings, it's an old... A newspaper building, and the funny guy in front of it said, okay, I'll, I'll handle that thing. I'm just going to fill it up with, uh, with all kinds of uh, creative uh, companies, but still it has to, of course, sort of be made much cooler uh, again to be able to attract these uh, people. And so at some point in our office life, uh, somebody dropped by and said, uh, that's the building. <laughs> we have to do something with. And this is not, not having been used for... It had been built less than 10 years ago. And already it's old mustard. It's a mustard factory with some offices in uh, Dijon, of course, the famous city of the mustard, um, by Unilever. And it's already abandoned again. Oh my God, that's what we're going to do with that. Uh, and there was this... Uh, this uh, company where you, uh, this call center company that wants to move in, uh, but also did kind of special project with these uh, people working in the, uh, in the call center, uh, making them uh, do some educational, uh, have, have educations in between uh, the moments they were working in a call center. And that, that's actually what we are dealing with. And uh, we also only had 400,000 euros at our uh, at our uh, disposal to, uh, to deal with. Uh, well, immediate reaction, of course, in the office was like, <laughs> it's not our thing to do this. And then uh, thinking about the 7 million square meters and thinking about our future as an office and thinking about our future in general, we thought, well, maybe we just should take this challenge and go for it. It was a bit like a reality show, you know, like you put on an island, like a Robinson, uh, uh, Crusoe kind of experience of having to deal with this. It's like the bottom rock bottom of, uh, of architecture, maybe. Uh, uh, no money, a lot of, a lot of building, uh, a lot of young people. And so we had to design basic... But it, it turns out it looks also a bit like this minimalist architecture that you have to make in affordable housing. So just be creative with space, uh, like in a hotel, cut out some floors, uh, adding others using color instead of beautiful materials, uh, using uh, pop art maybe, or using uh, learning from Las Vegas to uh, do the facade, because we just had money to put a sticker on the existing facade, and that would be actually the codes, QR codes that the call center uses. So their, their QR code is on the product, you scan it, and then you reach the call center. So 
That's the branding. Uh, it's the re redoing of this uh, facade. There you see the existing situation. There was a parking underneath. It's parking, and that's uh, the render. And that's reality, which should look pretty much the same, right? the render and the reality. And uh, so we did it, yeah. Interviewing also. Uh, <clears throat> we didn't have mon much money, of course, for finishing walls, etc. So uh, this is actually the client talking about the whole process of how this, uh, <laughs> how our project manager, uh, Bertrand, stayed calm and explained the reason for the design. Not giving in, of course, because he's working for us and if he would come back to the office and said, I gave in. He would lose his job anyway, but uh, yeah, this is sort of the happy, happy moment at the opening. Uh, it could actually be an architecture, uh, architecture school <laughs> at some point. I'm realizing now. So there's not much difference I've learned from architecture schools and call center uh, buildings. Uh, yeah, so this is fun. This is just realized this year. Yeah, more of it, more ugliness, having to deal with. Please convert this multi-brand store for me. Uh, no, thank you very much. I'm not. This is not my job. Well, maybe it is our job, uh, actually. So, and it now has become a kind of sport in the office to figure out what we can do. Yeah. So, and and like with the beautiful old buildings, also with the ugly old buildings, uh, it sort of provokes you to do things you would never do in. Uh, in new buildings, so as to build up a complete building only of uh, advertisement boards of what's inside. It's like there is no facade left in this building. And a uh, funny thing about these projects also that they're up like in, you know, you made you sent a design and next you know it, they've already, uh, this is under construction, but it's almost finished. Last design I'm going to show, I'm going to really move forward. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. I'm just going to flash through this one. Typology again, uh, dying typologies also, I would say. The public library. Um, again, no money, no budget. Uh, a lot of ambition from the, from, the from the head librarian. This being his library. Uh, this being more like his dream, you could say. And uh, the building we made for him in the incredible, fantastic city of Spijkenisse over there. This is Rotterdam. And this, sort of, this is the harbor that's been growing and growing after the Second World War. And in the process, eating up all these villages and turning them into the living quarters for the people working in the, in the harbor. Sort of endless sprawls of suburban uh, stuff growing out of this old, oh, there it is, uh, village, 1900. And then sort of more and more. Uh, and this is another time in the Netherlands, the 80s, uh, it should get cozy again, but still. Politicians, of course, can be quite interesting and important in this phase. This one of Ons Spijkenisse, our Spijkenisse. Uh, actually, he resigned uh, after 12 years, uh, some days ago. Spijkenisse is sort of losing its identity and refining it again through, for example, the famous inhabitant Afrojack, having a, at some short moment in time a famous girlfriend hanging around in Spijkenisse, uh, according to uh, our local networks. Uh, a growing interest in history uh, anyway, but also in uh, uh, rivaling, uh, rivaling Rotterdam, in uh, becoming a part of Europe, uh, actually, in recreating the bridge on our 10 euro sign, uh, in inviting really famous architects to make really uh, great buildings like Ben van Berkel uh, is doing, uh, this theater. Uh, but we ended up actually in the, in the village center, uh, what used to be the village center, discovering uh, that is interestingly enough, uh, right beside the church, our zoning envelope resembled a barn. Uh, this was the program for the building, the library, sort of three meter 20 high. And uh, I have to finish? Okay, I'll just move on. And uh, finding extra space in this envelope by just avoiding to make any corridors. Uh, at the, some commercial spaces at the bottom that we had to sort of conquer. Uh, 
commercial spaces that were supposed to uh, pay for the library partly, but are now empty, of course, in 2011. And just wrapping it up to a mountain of books covered by this uh, farm-like structure of uh, wooden laminated beam, wooden beams. Uh, this is under construction. Uh, sustainable issues, of course, uh, being solved. That's one of the benefits if your buildings take a little bit longer. You can make use of more techniques uh, uh, in the development of this building. This sort of small village created around it as well uh, of, uh, of, again, affordable housing, of course, and, and affordable and mid-income housing. Here you see the, the commercial space. And uh, this has just been opened uh, uh, some weeks ago. And, but here, of course, the real life is inside. And the street, the pavement is really going inside as you walk up into this library that is like a street almost. Because actually, public libraries are not so much about books anymore, but about sort of meet, being meeting places, gathering spaces, hangouts for people with nothing to do. Uh, reading newspapers, playing chess. Uh, and all is made by just three materials, which is the, the bricks, the wooden uh, beams, and uh, a recycled plastic that we use to uh, create the shelves with. Almost finished, the elevator couldn't be made out of bricks. Uh, and uh, the glimpse of uh, Spikenisse that you will also uh, see uh, uh, around it. Yeah, I'm looking at it too, but I, shouldn't, I should be looking at you. And I'm finalizing here in, uh, with this uh, last image. It should also be, always be a, uh, a night view of a building, I think. No? Just to request for access. OK, thanks. <laughs> Natalie, thank you very, very much. Uh, normally, we have <laughs> a substantial period for questions and answers. Oh. But I know that tonight, a lot of you have been promised beer and dogs at 5.30. And that was already seven minutes ago. Oh, sorry. So um, we are going to ask Natalie to stay with us for a few minutes. Those of you who are interested in engaging her in a discussion, please come and talk to her. Those of you who feel you have to rush to the beer and dogs, please <laughs> rush to the beer and dogs. And thank you again for being here today and to Natalie for really showing us incredible projects <laughs> that expect us, demonstrate to us that we can really look at architecture in a different way. Thank okay. you. And thank you, Natalie. Thank you.